Hey guys and welcome to How to Gastro. Today we will be talking about some terminology in gastroenterology. So let's get started. So what is gastroenterology? Gastroenterology is the field of medicine concerned with the function and disorders of the digestive system. So anything from the oral cavity right down to the rectum and anal canal concerns gastroenterology. Any sort of pathology is relating to the esophagus, the stomach, the small colon, the large colon, everything falls under gastro. We also deal with pathologies related to the liver and pancreas. So gastroenterology is actually quite a broad field indeed. One of the most common complaints in the field of gastroenterology is dysphagia. And what is dysphagia? Dysphagia is a difficulty in swallowing or a sensation of food sticking to the esophagus. Adonophagia is painful swallowing in the mouth, oropharynx or the esophagus and it can occur with or without dysphagia. And of course, adonophagia would be painful swallowing and is actually not dysphagia which is a difficulty in swallowing. So there is a difference between the two. Aphagia is the inability or refusal to swallow. Paradoxal dysphagia is something that occurs in 20% of patients with achalasia. And in these patients, we find that it's actually easier for them to swallow solid foods rather than liquids. And you can see here at the bottom with my schematic representation, in achalasia, there's actually a problem of the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. So that actually prevents the food from entering the stomach from the esophagus. And here the solids are actually able to push the sphincter open and get themselves into the stomach. But the liquids, however, just tend to hover around in here. In long-standing achalasia, we will have the esophageal dilation. So the lower part of the esophagus will actually dilate because of lots of liquid and food accumulation in this part of the esophagus. Nausea. Nausea is a feeling of sickness with an inclination to vomit. Vomiting means to eject matter from the stomach through the mouth. Indigestion is a pain or discomfort in the stomach associated with difficulty in digesting food. Belching. Belching is actually a normal process of releasing air through the mouth that accumulates in the stomach thereby relieving distension. Bloating. Bloating is a lay term for postprandial abdominal fullness and basically postprandial means after eating. So postprandial abdominal fullness or swelling usually understood to mean due to retention of gas in the stomach or the GI tract. Hiccups. A hiccup is an extraordinary type of respiratory movement involving a sudden intake of air due to an involuntary contraction of the diaphragm accompanied by the closure of the glottis, which is the vocal apparatus of the larynx. Flatulence. Flatulence is a medical term for releasing gas from the digestive system through the anus. Hematomnesis. Hematomnesis is the vomiting of blood and the appearance of vomit depends on the amount and character of the gastric contents at the time the blood is vomited and on the length of the time the blood has been in the stomach. Hematochesia. Hematochesia is the passage of fresh blood per anus, usually with stools. So hematochesia is different from hematomnesis because hematomnesis means vomiting of blood and hematochesia actually means the passage of fresh blood in stools. Melena. Melena is the passage of dark, tarry stools containing decomposing blood that is usually an indication of bleeding in the upper part of the digestive tract and especially in the esophagus, stomach and duodenum. So you can imagine if we had a bleeding here due to say an esophageal cancer or an ulcer or down here even uh, at the lesser curvature of the stomach we could have an ulcer there. If these areas tend to bleed uh, that blood still has to pass throughout the digestive system before it leaves the body through the anus. So by the time the blood passes through the entire gastrointestinal tract, that fresh red-like blood that first appeared in the esophagus or the stomach is going to be digested by the digestive tract and is going to be passed out in the stools as a very dark, tarry material. 
Diarrhea. Diarrhea is the passing of frequent and loose stools that can be watery and acute diarrhea goes away in a few weeks and it becomes chronic when it lasts longer than four weeks. Constipation. Constipation is infrequent and frequently incomplete bowel movements and constipation is the opposite of diarrhea of course and is commonly caused by irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulosis and some medications. Cytophobia is the fear of food or eating. Esophageal viruses. Esophageal viruses are extremely dilated submucosal veins in the esophagus. They are most often a consequence of portal hypertension, commonly due to cirrhosis. Patients with esophageal viruses have a strong tendency to develop bleeding. So as you can see here in my schematic representation on the right, these submucosal dilated veins are actually prone to bleeding uh, when food passes through the esophagus. So you can imagine food passing down this tube, it will cause some sort of abrasion to these veins because they're very superficial. And uh, patients with esophageal viruses will frequently present to the clinic with melena because of course this is an upper GI bleed. Jaundice. Jaundice is a medical condition with the yellowing of the skin or the whites of the eyes arising from the excess pigment bilirubin and typically caused by the obstruction of the bile duct, by liver disease or by excessive breakdown of red blood cells. So you can see here down below we have a patient on the left without jaundice and then on the right with jaundice and you can notice the yellowing of his skin. And on the right here we have the sclera which is actually the white of the eye that is now yellow because the patient has jaundice. And jaundice is typically caused by three main factors and those are prehepatic causes, hepatic causes and post-hepatic causes and the prehepatic causes of jaundice are the excessive breakdown of red blood cells and this occurs in patients with hemolytic anemia per se and we can also have hepatic causes of jaundice which is by a primary liver disease or we could also have a post-hepatic cause of jaundice which could mean an obstruction in the bile duct and that could be due to a stone, uh, biliary lithiasis or a tumor involving the biliary ducts. Borborygmy is the audible rumbling abdominal sounds due to gas gurgling with liquid as it passes through the intestines. Dehydration is an excessive loss of fluids in the body. Distension is a swelling of the abdomen. Feces are waste eliminated from the bowels. A fecalith is a hard mass of dried feces. And something to note here is that this is a common cause of appendicitis. So you can see down below on the left we have a normal appendix and in the middle here we have an inflamed appendix and you can see this is sort of bulge here and if you had to take a closer look at that it is actually due to a fecalith which is a hard mass of dried feces a small one which is obstructing the lumen of the appendix and this is actually the cause of inflammation and that is why many patients develop appendicitis food allergy uh, food allergies are an immune system response by which the body creates antibodies as a reaction to certain foods. And studies show that true food allergies are only present in 1-2% to of adults. And I've put a picture here down below which shows the most common food allergens. Some common ones are tree nuts, soy, fish, peanuts, shelled fish, eggs, wheat and dairy. A laxative. Uh, a laxative is a compound that loosens stools, increases fecal water content, and increases bowel movements. Nutrient. A nutrient is a chemical compound such as a protein, fat, carbohydrate, vitamin, or mineral that makes up food. Parenteral nutrition. So parenteral nutrition is the slow infusion of a solution of nutrients into a vein through a catheter which may or may not be surgically implanted. This may be partial due to supplement food and nutrient intake or total TPN, total parental nutrition, providing the sole source of energy and nutrient intake for the patient. 
So on the right here, you can see there's different access points that we can use to give a patient parenteral nutrition. And you can see here, there could be a peripheral vein access, a subclavian vein access, or a superior vena cava access. And this is actually very important in patients, for example, who have a completely obstructing esophageal carcinoma. So they will not be able to take in any kind of nutrition per us or by their oral cavity. So we have to resort to giving them parenteral nutrition. A sphincter. A sphincter is a ring of muscle that opens and closes and acts as a valve in various checkpoints of the GI tract. And I've put down below here some examples of sphincters. And we have the esophageal sphincter, which controls the inflow of food from the esophagus into the stomach. We also have a pyloric sphincter, which controls the exit of food from the stomach into the small intestine or the duodenum. And on the right here, we have the external and internal sphincters, which actually make up the anal sphincter and allow for the passage of feces out of the body. Stricture. A stricture is an abnormal narrowing of a tubular part of the body. And I put an example here on the left we can have a esophageal stricture and here you can see this is an abnormal narrowing of the esophageal tube and on the right hand side I showed you what this would look like on a barium swallow as you can see here this narrowing is very prominent and we could use a barium swallow to diagnose a patient with an esophageal stricture. Pruritus. Pruritus is an unpleasant sensation of the skin provoking the desire to scratch or rub it and it is also called itching and this is important in patients with uh, liver cirrhosis who present with jaundice and the bilirubin deposits in the skin are actually very itchy and they cause the patient to have lots of pruritus. Diverticulum or diverticula plural are small bulging sacs pushing outward from the GI tract and as a person ages, pressure within the GI tract causes pockets of tissue or little sacs that push out from the GI walls. And they're common throughout the GI tract. And I put here some examples at the bottom. This is an example of a esophageal diverticulum. And in the middle here, you can see multiple diverticuli uh, in the large colon. And they're very common in the sigmoid area. So this is something important to note. And this is what the diverticula would actually look like on a colonoscopy. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, subscribe, comment and share. And if you would like to download this presentation, you can click the link in the description. See you guys next time. Bye bye.